Hello and welcome to Next Gen Privileged Access Management for Public Sector Organizations. Today's webinar is sponsored by Keeper and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is Scott Becker. I'm from Actual Tech and I'm excited to be your moderator for this special event. Now, before we get to today's great content, we do have four housekeeping items that will help you get the most out of this session. First off, we want this to be an informative event for you, so we encourage any questions in the questions box in your webinar control panel. So not only will we have team members responding to questions during the live event, but we'll also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the presentation where we'll discuss in greater detail some of the top questions that you ask. A Q&A panel is also the place to let us know about any technical issues that you might be experiencing. A browser refresh will fix most audio, video, or slide advancement issues, but if that doesn't work, just let us know there in the Q&A and we'll provide further technical assistance. Now, second, in the handout section of your webinar control panel, you'll find that we're offering several resources. I'd especially like to call your attention to an industry brief on zero trust security. That's a PDF in there that, that you can grab from the handouts. I encourage you to access that resource now and, and share it with your friends and colleagues. Now, third, at the end of this webinar event, we'll be awarding a $250 Amazon gift card to one lucky registrant. Of course, you must be in attendance during the live event to qualify for the prize. The official terms and conditions of today's prize drawing can be found in the handout section as well. Just scroll to the bottom and you'll find the, the prize uh, terms and conditions link there. Now, finally, one of the best benefits of an event like this is the opportunity to ask a question of our expert presenter. So to help encourage your questions, we have a special additional prize for you. That's another Amazon gift card, this one for $50 for the best question. So after the event is over, we'll look at all the questions that came in and the actual tech media team will pick out the very best one and contact that prize winner. Okay, so with that housekeeping out of the way, let's get to today's fantastic session. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter today, Mike Epps, who's Director for Public Security at Keeper Security. Mike, welcome. Thanks for hey, being Pat. here. Yeah, thank you. Excited to be here. Looking forward to it. Great. Well, I'm going to get out of your way and uh, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, thank you. Hey, guys, thanks for showing up today. We're excited to have you with us. Know your time is valuable. Um, the goal today is keep it exciting and, and energetic and then hopefully um, some interaction as well. Um, again, my name is Mike Epps. Uh, when I'm done today, uh, Donegan Mata, our federal um, account executive, will also give you a demo and you'll be able to kind of peek over his shoulder and take a look at what we're talking about today uh, in a live demo. Uh, with that said, he talked about the Q&A. I got a couple questions for you. You can answer those and pop those in. Let us know you're listening and kind of gives us a little bit of insight as to who's here. So the first question is, uh, prior to this uh, presentation or getting the, uh, the invite, have you heard of Keeper Security before? So if you don't mind, just pop that question in there. Again, it lets it be a little interactive. Um, so that's the first question. All right. The second question is, if you don't mind answering for me, um, is do you use Keeper? Um, so um, first, have you heard of it? And if you have, do you use Keeper at all? And I'll kind of wait. Yep, we've got some folks chiming in there. Appreciate that. And then the last question is, and out of curiosity for my benefit, in your role that you're in today, are you involved or are you responsible for any type of PAM, Privilege Access Management or Password Security? Are you involved in that? It'd be interesting to know that. Okay, thank you guys for answering, appreciate that. So here's kind of how I wanna kick this off. It's, it's, it's a little experience that I've had and I would just about bet that most of you have had something similar to this or, or, or maybe you've heard of it. But so I live in Austin, Texas. So depending on where you're at in the world today, um, not throwing any shade where you live, it's 75 degrees today and a little shameless plug for our city, uh, the, the, the music capital of, of the world. And so excited to be here and again, to, to, to deliver this with you today. So he, here's the experience I had. So I used to live downtown Austin and we decided to pack up and move about a mile south of downtown. So still pretty much downtown. And the first thing I decided to do was when I when we went from a condo, a high rise condo to a house was to do what any, you know, I'm from Arkansas, any red blooded Arkansan would do is you got to go uh, buy a smoker, bought, bought a smoker, but I needed a cover for it. So I got on Amazon, had Amazon ship me a smoker cover to my front door. The first package I've ever received um, in my brand new house was was this this cover. And when it got here, I never got it. 
Because what I didn't know is in this part of town, in a lot of parts of town, is that you have these people riding around in their cars and they're identifying any package and they'll just run up and grab the package as you've, you've heard this before, a little porch pirate. And someone eventually said, hey, I've, you know, to, to their surprise, when they got down the road and ripped the package open, nope, it was just a grill cover and they left it down the road. But what really surprised me is that uh, on our little local Facebook group, how people were, as I went and tried to figure out, you know, is this a thing that it's a, it's a, it's a big deal and everyone's posting about it. And what's crazy to me is how surprised they are every time someone steals a package, even though everybody knows this happens, everybody's seen it happen, heard of it happen, or it's happened to them like it did to me, they're blown away by it. And I thought to myself, as soon as it happened, I'll just solve this real quick. I just won't have packages delivered to my front door. When I moved here, I wanted to protect my house. So we had a security alarm put in, right? There's some surveillance put on that. I locked the front door. I've got a keypad. I can maybe provide the right access to the right people. But what I forgot to do was to secure the packages. What is kind of the easy thing at the front door. So what I did is I ran to the UPS. And for 300 bucks a year, I have a place that can receive my packages, sign for my packages, lock my packages up, secure those. And when I'm ready, I can go pick those up. And it really surprised me. And as I kind of think about that, and I think about really why we're here today, number one, it, it surprises me how oftentimes people who all know that my packages at the front door are vulnerable. We spend all this money inside the house to protect our goods inside the house, but then we'll have a pair of shoes or maybe an expensive gift, maybe Christmas time, which is a big time. We just deliver on the front door. And we know we have an option to do something, but it requires effort. It would require energy. It would require changing the way I do things. And so we default back to just delivering the front door and hope nobody gets it. And the reason I think of that is because the thing that you and I both know and I know that because we all know this It's no surprise here that the crazy that the thing is, and we'll get you advanced to this slide. There it is. And this is no surprise to you. Same way it was really no surprise to anybody else when they get packages stolen off their front door is 74 percent of all data breaches are weakened or stolen passwords. And 62 percent of employees share passwords and, and we all do it. So there's no shame here at least yet, right? But we all do it. And then 99% of all attacks could have been stopped by 2FA. They even say, look, people don't hack in, they usually just log in. And again, no surprise, but I did think it was interesting. There was a, a cabinet level agency who had a watchdog group kind of come in and, and really honestly say, look, we have all these, all these accounts, 85,944 accounts. And we'd like to see how secure we are. Do we follow best practices? So can you hack those accounts? Now type into this account, uh, type in, if you will, out of the 85,944 accounts, how many accounts do you think were hacked? And if you'll just type that in there, I'd appreciate it, gives a little feedback again, a little interaction. How many accounts do you think were hacked when they said, let's, out of these 85, how many do you think you can find? Got it? Any takers here? Everybody's like, I'm not sure I want to be wrong. Well, I'll give you the first clue is it wasn't all 85,000. It was 18,174 packages essentially left at the front door. 288 of those accounts had escalated privileges. 362 had senior government employees. Now here's the second, if I asked you, what do you think the, the number one password hack was? You'd get that one right. But would you get if you, would you get the second one? The second most hacked password. Any, anybody want any takers and put it in there? Well, I'll tell you this, it was used 389 accounts on 389 accounts. You know what it was? Broncos 2012, but they were sly about it. They used, zeros for the O's and they use a dollar sign for the S and it was used 389 times and you got the password one, two, three, four. What I thought was interesting and kind of funny because right, they're getting alerts. You should change your password. You should change it. Now the sixth most used password used 130 times was change capital it capital now exclamation mark. It's if they were poking 
As if they were saying, yeah, I got packages at the front door. The second one, or the number seven was change it one, two, three. It's kind of interesting. And I think people are surprised for whatever reason when this happens. Now, for our purposes, as we kind of move into privilege access management, that's just the front door. We've not even got what's happening behind the door just yet. So the question is, what if the enemy bypasses the front door? What if they get past it entirely because they got a hold to your ring doorbell access code? Or they could bribe someone to give to, to let them in, or they could impersonate if you even live in a high rise, a trusted resident. And they start exploiting hidden passages, maybe. Maybe they found a window that's open. What happens then? So, yes, there's something to do on the on the at the front door, but how do we protect it on the inside? You see, traditional password or credential or PAM, it's, it's like handing out a single key. This is how it's been done traditionally. And you have access code or, or a single key or an access code to every door. That's where identity-based attacks come in. They target the keys. They start targeting credentials. They start turning trusted advisors, people that don't know, into uh, essentially what's an accomplice. See, preventing identity breaches is not just about protecting the data, although that's super important, right? We agree to that. It's about securing the foundation of your actual security posture. So we find ourselves like, I got to protect data, got to protect data, got it. But if we're going to pre prevent identity breaches, then we've got to begin to change the way we present our security posture. Because if attackers can compromise identities, then they get to move freely inside the system. If attacker can move into your house and, and get that keypad, they can, they can now move anywhere they want inside, wreaking havoc, stealing data, classified, leaked information, critical infrastructures disrupted. Identity breaches can have a cascading consequence. Again, no secret to you. But here's what I'll tell you, and this is why I think we're here today. That's why Keeper was, was founded back in 2011. We were founded because there were two visionaries um, that started our company, Darren Gucciani and Craig Leary, and they were at a college campus and they saw that that as, as all of a sudden uh, in the palm of, of everyone's hand were iPhones and they had their and then they had their devices, their laptop devices, and they saw where credential in the front door was going to directly be affected. And they said, look, we need a platform that goes across all platforms to give people access at the right time on every machine at all times. And they said, we need to be able to track and monitor that access. We need to be able to provide complete visibility, not just inside threat, but outside threat as, as well. Said it needs to be uh, an agnostic platform, any type of record, not just passwords, pass keys, any type of personal information. So any record across any system, any browser, any OS, any computing system, and they, in that moment, they, they, they kind of set the stage for we are going to be market listeners. We're going to move fast and we're going to move first. And so they started with passwords. But that's not where they stopped because they knew where the market was going. They, they understood the concept of identity breaches and that we need to protect the packages at the front door. That's a, almost a too easy thing to do. We need to be able to start to protect from behind the door. So they listened to the market again. And they looked at the survey of 400 IT security executives and they said, let me, can I ask you about your current PAM solution? And here's what they said, 84%. And if you're involved in PAM, you will relate to this because 84% want to simplify their PAM solution. 68% said they wasted money on features that they rarely use. There's this real big platform and it. Yeah, it did good, but I paid for all of this and I'm not even getting the value out of it. And it's hard to manage, it's hard to maintain. And 85% said it requires a dedicated staff and oftentimes a multiple staff and long lead times to deploy and then to maintain. So they listened to the market. And when they listened to the market, the market continued to say, look, the problem is it's cost, difficult to provision, it's difficult to use, I don't have real visibility, and honestly, it's not providing me adequate security. So in listening to what and in, in being the good listeners and leading in the market that those gentlemen were, they said, well, let's go get visibility. Let's take the same concept that we created in traditional or with our password management and let's extend that um, to the enterprise. 
Let's extend that to the machines. If passwords were there to protect humans by and large, then we want to create something to protect our machines. And so in doing so, the vision was to say, what if, how do we start with protecting secrets? Secrets meaning just the concept that DevOps teams manage all these large secrets, SSH keys, API tokens, database credentials. And they looked at it and said, and, and secrets tend to be hard coded and they're stored insecurely. So how do we take them out of the, the, the hard code? And how do we help the, the, the users to create their, uh, to, to extend their security posture and, and, and say, look, no more scattered secrets. The other thing they looked at was connections because legacy privilege access allows admins to just establish connections to systems. And the connections manage the tools are complex. They're difficult to deploy, right? And they're not user friendly, as we've stated. And then there's the compatibility issue, which is, which is, I think, a, a super significant issue. And it creates a degradation in our, in our, in our security posture because the compatibility issues and the limitations in the, in the integration, um, and some of the, um, automation was not there. So they built the solution. They said, what if we build, and then they built Keeper Government or Keeper Security Government Cloud, purpose built for government. It's a comprehensive suite, including the most critical components of PAM without this complexity to high cost. So layer on passwords, passwords are part of PAM. Oftentimes people want to say, oh, passwords and PAM. We look at it as an entire concern and an entire platform to build around. So our PAM solutions, passwords, privilege accounts and session management and secrets management. And we're going to show you what this looks like. So for us, enterprise password management, give the user across all platforms a, a, a ubiquitous platform to create strong and unique passwords, even a place to store pass keys, a place that you as an admin in a, especially in an enterprise environment can enforce 2FA. You can enforce password policy. You can get a readout of your organization's password hygiene. You can look and see if something's been found on the dark web. You can even get alerts on your Apple Watch in real time as they are found. As you guys know, the mother of all hacks happened uh, last week or the week before. It's the largest um, a delivery of stolen credentials delivered to the dark web. We'll keep her here to help give visibility to that. And there's a lot more to offer with that. And then we added Secrets Manager to eliminate the sprawl, to give to, to identify and remove those hard coded, coded credentials, all within the same platform, not having to bolt on, not having to buy additional um, components and, and layer those on, and then use your manpower to be able to deliver uh, that capability. But it all sits in one, in the same visibility and platform. And then last but not least, our Connections Manager. If you've heard of Apache Guacamole, based on Apache Guacamole, Simple, secure access to remote infrastructure. Some call it the VPN killer because no VPN is required in doing this. No agent, no client, and no VPN to be able to provide a ubiquitous PAM platform that stretches across, giving everyone the right access at the right time based on least privileged access. So with that said, I'm going to turn over to Dunnigan. As I do, here's what I want to offer to you. Offer to you a three, a free three-year personal password manager subscription. It's, it's Look at it as a trial. If you go to keeper.io forward slash free, you can do that. Now it's going to require for you to put in your business um, email address. Um, should you leave that organization, it's real quick. We can simply um, change that to a personal, but we're going to offer that to you today uh, for free for three years. And all you have to do is go to this website, keeper.io forward slash free. And with that said, I want to turn the, the, the TV time here over to Dunnigan Mata to give you that over his shoulder look at what we're talking about so you can see the ease of use and you can see how easy this is to, to deliver to what we call PAM for everyone. Dunnigan? Thanks so much, Mike. That was awesome. Um, start sharing my screen and we'll dive right in. <clears throat> so first, um, let me drop it to just really quickly this overview. Um, just so you can see this graphic before I jump in um, and you can kind of visualize what it looks like to actually deploy Keeper to an enterprise. And I'll say this, um, you know, every organization is different when they deploy Keeper. Um, so like Mike said, our bread and butter since we founded was the password manager. There still are quite a bit of organizations that, you know, are immature in a PAM strategy, maybe don't have a use case, for example, like really small schools, like K through 12 schools or what have you, right? 
Um, and they're just looking for a password manager. Maybe they still haven't even implemented two-factor authentication as an organization. That's fine. Um, and their chief concern is typically user friendliness and ease of deployment. You know, and obviously security is a concern, but that's really, they're just hoping their employees will use a password manager. And that's the behavior they're looking to change. And that's great. And we can absolutely do that for, for anyone that needs that. Um, now, organizations that already kind of have that going or, you know, the initiative's kind of already started, um, typically are looking at Keeper as a PAM solution um, if they're not immediately, you know, once they learn kind of about everything we do. And this graphic kind of shows what it's looked like to actually deploy it as a PAM. And um, just stepping back, deploying it as a password manager, we can meet kind of the most basic use cases that users have so they can, you know, it can be a really simple experience, let's say. Um, there's a lot of concern about, hey, you know, we have a workforce that's not super technical or what have you, you know, we're looking for something as user friendly as humanly possible. We can taper an experience down for a group of users within an organization to make it super simple. You have role-based policy with Keeper, so everyone's experience can be dictated by the administrators of the organization. And that password manager could be used on the end user side here on the left side of this graphic. You're talking about accounting, finance, legal, procurement, HR, and kind of everyone in between, anyone really that's outside of that traditional PAM role and IT DevOps and SecOps. And they're using Keeper to manage their passwords for maybe databases, maybe for shared credentials amongst like a finance team. They're typically big power users outside of an IT staff um, and so on. There's obviously a ton of examples of things they could be storing in these vaults. Um, and it can go well beyond passwords. If you allow them to, they can use Keeper for secure file storage and file sharing. Not outright, it would be more for one-off file sharing scenarios where it was desired to have an encrypted link to do so. And Keeper can help facilitate that in this environment. Um, and then all the use cases Mike had talked about with the overall PAM solution, that same vault that your end users are using to store their passwords for really basic websites and applications um, can also be the vault that your, you know, your SecOps person is using to launch connections to a Windows machine or a Linux box um, that they could be used to, to rotate passwords for Active Directory accounts, you know, amongst other things. Um, and so there's quite a bit of functionality that comes out of the box. And ultimately, when you deploy Keeper out to an organization, the first step is to take care of the vault, the passwords, right, clean up the hygiene, and the individuals have their own visibility into their own password hygiene once they start populating records in here. And organizations have an overall administrative view of that as well here on the admin console side where I'm going I'm to bounce back and forth a little bit um, for you. So going back here to the vault, there are two ways you can log into a Keeper vault. Um, you can log in natively with some form of two-factor authentication and a master password or you can log in with single sign-on, which is what's more, more common at the enterprise level. Uh, we can integrate with any SAML 2.0 compliant identity provider, um, including organizations that are in like a Azure GCC high environment, for example, we can integrate right in. There can be multiple identity providers in one organization, you know, keep your tenants can support that. And that can be done for provisioning, deprovisioning and authentication. So if you have, for example, like a CAT card or a smart card of some kind tied to your identity provider, that whole login process will be respected to get into your Keeper vault. And I'll show you that really quickly uh, from my desktop application of Keeper, which is one of our five applications. Um, you have this desktop app, you have a mobile phone application for iOS and Android. We invented mobile autofill, so that experience is excellent with the mobile. Um, you have browser extensions for all major browsers. Um, you have a command line CLI tool for scripting called Keeper Commander SDK. And of course your web vault, which is just like going to our website and pressing login. And I'll show you really quickly the SSO login. So I would just type in my email associated with, with my single sign-on and it'll launch me through Keeper's patented SSO Connect technology through to my login for, in this case, Microsoft. And I'll be prompted to log in, do that now. And once I successfully log in to my, whoops, identity provider, I type in password correctly. It'll pass me through to the vault after authenticating on the pairing keys on the SSO side. And once that's confirmed, I'll be in my vault, which is what you see here. And so there's, you have those two ways you can log in. I'm going back now, this is the web vault, this user interface here. Um, the first thing I would do when I first got started would be importing my passwords, wherever they are now. We can import from browsers, from existing password managers, and from CSV files if folks have stored things maybe in Excel or if they've exported them in CSV format. 
if they're on the famous sticky notes, they will have to manually create records, um, but everything else, you know, they can import um, that way. Once the import's complete, which is typically like instantaneous, um, they'll click breach watch. Our breach watch function is telling you these passwords are compromised. For example, that <clears throat> large breach that just happened that Mike mentioned where all these credentials are now on the dark web, you know, they're from a ton of different websites. Breach watch is out ahead of that, um, scanning the dark web, partnered with a company called SpyCloud for this service. And unlike kind of other things out there that'll tell you, hey, your password's compromised, Keeper maintains zero knowledge as a part of this process, as well as everything we do here. So no point do we have access to your, any of your data. We can't reset your passwords. There's nothing we can do on our end. Everything is stored in ciphertext and everything's encrypted on our side and the keys are owned by you. Um, so that extends here to BreachWatch. These are all done through hashing. And ultimately we're telling you that these passwords are compromised, not this password for this username tied to this website. Now, if you're using Keeper to generate passwords, and I'll show you what that looks like. Manually generate a password using our password generator here. Our passwords are going to look pretty wild. They're going to look like ciphertext by default, pretty difficult to remember uh, by design. We are releasing passphrases shortly as well, quickly becoming the new federal standard. Um, so you'll see those as options as well here soon. Um, but for now, this is what they look like. Now, if this password found its way on the dark web, I can almost certainly assume that that website was compromised because I'm only using this password for that website. So once you have clean passwords, if you're seeing breaches, it's because the company itself was compromised. Um, and so breach watch is a way to get out ahead of that. Um, Travis is on with us, actually had an experience with that himself, um, out ahead of a, a breach. And so you would visit these websites and applications. You'd want to start here and change these passwords. And administrators have an oversight of how many breach credentials each person has in their vault. So they can monitor that too. That zero knowledge does extend to the administrators. And then the second place I would want to go to clean up my password hygiene is security audit. I would stack rank these weak to strong. I'm looking to change anything that's not green and anything that's reused here with the goal of giving myself to 100% here and having no breaches. And if we can get everyone within an organization to do that, the security posture of that organization is significantly improved. And it's really quick. We'll show you this login. Uh, it's really quick to change passwords. Keeper makes it easy. This is our browser extension that I just popped open. Um, these are available on all major browsers. And like all our other applications, these can be deployed out to your machines. Um, all that can be found in our docs portal, docs.keeper.io, um, all that information. And you can keyword search here. So I'm going to go to Dropbox. And if I press this click the fill button, it's going to open a new tab and initiate my login process. So let me just show you this really quick. Um, I actually have a two-factor code embedded within my Keeper record for Dropbox. And that can be auto-filled when I visit this website. Um, you, by default, out of the box, you have this ability as an end user to actually add two-factor codes to records. If you're, you know, you don't like that concept, you can disable that too. We're showing you a wide open account here, but everything is configurable um, all the way down to the role level. So, you know, maybe only certain people can do that and set it up that way. But I'll show you, this is one of my favorite features of Keeper. So it'll auto-fill my username, my password, and then when the two-factor is called for, it will auto-fill that for me as well. I'll sign in, and whenever I, I will then navigate to wherever I would go to change that password for this website. Let's say this was one of my breach credentials, and Keeper will assist me with this process. Say change password. Yes, I would like some help. Current password, I just have to press this little hover lock on the old password box. New password, I'm gonna do the same thing. Well, actually, let me show you this. Um, and again, this is like an enterprise functionality here with a policy, this, you don't have to put this in place, but this is something that a lot of our customers do choose to do. Like for example, folks enforcing CGIS, which calls for 20 character passwords, will often use this, uh, which is called the domain complexity requirement on the Keeper Administrator console side. You can set them here at the role level. You can go into fault features and actually add a domain and require specific complexity for the password for that website for those users in this role within your organization. And that's what my administrator requires of me, a 50 character password for Dropbox. So I can't actually drag this below 50 characters. I can take it out to hundred, but I can't take it below. And whenever I like what I see from the password generator, I press that new password box, save it, change it, and I'm good to go. And if that is a shared credential that you know a couple different employees within my organization have access to, that'll be updated for them immediately as well. And the new password will be reflected back here in the vault.
And that process of going to the websites, changing them, is your password hygiene cleanup assignment and your, you know, end user going back to this graphic, you know, accounting, finance, legal procurement, all those folks outside of the traditional PAM role. That's kind of their main assignment. And doing that exercise, you learn how to use Keeper. Um, you can deploy these to all your machines. Any controls you have in place on your identity provider side will be respected with Keeper. For example, like, uh, hey, you can only sign into company devices, right? That'll all be respected um, within, within Keeper as well. It'll be added as an application to your identity provider. And then a couple of big use cases you have with, with um, using the Vault beyond just kind of the basics is sharing. Sharing is a big use case. You have three ways to do it with Keeper. This can be done both internally and externally outside of your organization. And the most common way to share is through the shared folder system for internal sharing. And this is a permission. So maybe only certain people can do this. You have the ability to create the uh, folder and you can add individual records in here. And these can be any record types. These could be basic website and application passwords. There could be files in here, payment cards, amongst our many other number of record types, database credentials, servers, software licenses, SSH keys. And you also have the ability to create custom records as an admin and then make those custom records available to the organization or to a specific role within an organization. And you have the ability to change permissions here based on what a user might need um, to do with this record. Typically they're view only by default. So that'll be your call to change them. And if they are changed, these are all auditable security events as is the majority of what I'm doing in here. Like the password I just changed, the records I've interacted with here, certainly these permissions I've changed within this folder. And if I delete a record, as soon as I press save, that's all gonna be logged and saved in the admin console. And that can then be fed out to a SIM solution. Um, and those are all set up here in the admin console side. You have quite a few native integrations. And for those that uh, use a solution not listed here, you can send it to all most modern SIMs will take a syslog push and you can set it that way. And there's over 180 events you can report on for individuals or for the entire organization. And these will be fed out in real time. Uh, you have sharing events, policy changes, uh, breach events, you know, that may occur uh, amongst, you know, any number of other things, failed logins, successful logins, and that all can be monitored and fed out to your SIM. And there may be things that you consider mission critical that you also want an alert on for. You can send alerts via text, email, or webhook. A lot of our customers will send these to Slack or Teams so their IT team can monitor these. Uh, one of those that's almost always monitored is Vault Transfer. Really important to highlight, especially for smaller organizations where you may have a single point of failure in terms of a human resource, like one person in procurement, for example. If they leave, it's gonna be a big deal for the organization. A lot, to, a lot of pieces to pick up, maybe locked out of quite a few things. A lot of our customers have had this happen um, previously, like before coming to Keeper. So you have this vault transfer that allows you to transfer a vault and all of its contents for business continuity when, when someone leaves your organization. There's no peeking into my vault. You can't take a quick peek into it and see what I have going on inside of it. You can see if I have access to shared credentials. You can prevent me from actually creating my own records if that was ever appropriate and essentially set up a view-only vault. Like you can really lock down a user's experience, but you cannot take a peek and see the records that I create myself in my vault. And that's all by design. Uh, but we can create this in whatever type of environment you're envisioning, whether you're looking to just have more of like user friendliness and just trying to get them to use a password manager, or hey, we're in a hyper secure lockdown offline environment where we don't want users creating any records of their own unless they're in shared folders that we own and have visibility to, essentially creating a view only vault. All those are possible to keep her. Um, going back in here. So you have that internal sharing through this folder system. Um, you can add individuals. You can also add teams to view these records. The teams can be manually assembled in the admin console um, in the admin tab, just creating a team this way. You can also map those from your identity provider, like Azure security groups or Octopush groups, for example, and, and they'll pull over that way just to make sharing easier. And you can give them permissions beyond none to manage users and records of one or the other, if that's ever appropriate. You can also share internally um, an individual record by just pressing this big blue share button on a record itself, selecting a coworker and giving them any permissions if necessary. Um, you can also transfer ownership of these records over to them. And, and that leads me to kind of an example I always use on, on these types of calls. So let's say you're in a remote environment. 
you have uh, an employee that starts, you know, tomorrow and you send them their machine. They've confirmed they received it um, via, uh, you know, the mail or you send them their computer. And that's day one. They need their login for that machine. You can send it to them via one time share. These links are device specific, time sensitive and encrypted and do not require the recipient to actually have a keeper license. And you can generate these links. And I don't know, if anyone wants to try this out, this QR code is live and will allow you to actually see this record. Uh, it'll only allow one person to do that. So whoever does it first will be able to access this password. And if anybody else tries it, it'll say bad URL and it will not work. I'll just hold that up there for a second if anyone wants to try. And that's going to leave an audit trail as well. My admin will see that I just did this one time share and then it was sent outside of my organization and a couple of other details around this share. Uh, so that would be the use case, right? I get this login for my computer now and this remote employee. You may then send to me my, you know, Azure or Okta login. Or what have you, the default password that I'm going to change on my first login. And I do that successfully. And then you tell me to go to keepersecurity.com. You can set up just-in-time provisioning. And as soon as I type in my email, I'll get sent to that Azure screen or Okta screen, just the same way you saw when I showed the Azure login on the desktop app there, just a little bit earlier. Um, and it will spin up, spin up my license and I'll sign in. And if I'm also tied to a security group in Azure, in that example, I, I might be in a team that already has some shared folders, so I might already have records of my first login. Uh, you may also have created for me like 15 or 20 passwords, personal records that I need to do my job. Uh, you can create those, you can click all those records, and instead of giving me permissions, you can just transfer ownership of those records into my vault. You know they were securely created and that they got to me. So a lot of organizations use Keeper to make the onboarding process of a new employee more efficient and more secure. And that one time share, and all these are permissions, by the way, it's this like a wide open account. If this is giving you a heart attack, not everyone can be able to do this um, if that's what's desired. Um, file sharing is one of the biggest use cases with that one time share. We see this across all different types of verticals for all different types of reasons. It could be working on a contract. It could be evidence in the case of like courts or law enforcement. It could be any number of things that are being sent via one time share to any number of recipients, again, who do not need keeper licenses. Um, you use this web vault where I am now, I can put up to 100 megabytes of information in one record. If I use the desktop application, I can put up to five gigabytes. And if I use the mobile app, I can put up to 100 gigabytes in one record and share it off the same way I did that password via one-time share. And it, uh, the recipient can download it, so that would be something to consider. It would only be in a situation where it was appropriate for the recipient to download it. Uh, again, we'll leave an audit trail. Uh, but there are tons of use cases for this finance procurement, someone working on contracts, you name it. Um, you can send files this way. A lot of organizations have a desire to find an, an encrypted file sharing solution and Keeper does this out of the box. Um, and that's kind of your end user experience in a nutshell from the password manager perspective. Now this same vault, um, if you chose to utilize the whole Keeper PAM suite, Using Secrets Manager would allow you to integrate with CI CD platforms, anything that'll help with the application building and development process. You have the ability to rotate passwords for all different types of things, active directory accounts, databases, servers, um, amongst you know, other demonstrated use cases. Um, if you type in Keeper Security Password Rotation use cases, it'll take you to our docs portal and show you all the demonstrated use cases we have so far, and that list continues to grow as we continue to find new functionality our customers want in, in the way of password rotation. Um, just like everything else with Keeper, all this is audible you know, activities. But one of the coolest things, and Mike mentioned it, was removing hard-coded credentials here. Um, so you're actually putting in, in lieu of hard-coded credentials, a token that's calling upon the vault to rotate those credentials, all of which will leave an audit trail. A lot of our customers will have to rotate passwords for certain privileged you know, accounts. Uh, typically quarterly, and that all needs to be logged, so they use Keeper to do that. And that connect, or the Secrets Manager will serve as the bridge to Keeper Connection Manager, which helps you protect and provide as-needed permissions to connect to various endpoints, um, Windows, Boxes, Linux machines, uh, SQL servers, you name it. And using the Secrets Manager as a bridge, that password um, is tokenized and sent back to the vault, so ultimately any time that password is rotated, not only can the connection still happen, but that password is updated and reflected back in the vault. So the solutions all talk to one another by design and they're all managed under this same admin console. You see you have the tabs here for secrets and for connection manager all here. Um, 
And I'll pause there. Um, Mike, anything else you'd like me to cover here that you think I didn't cover? Or any questions from, from those in the audience at this point? Yeah, um, real quick, cover our built for government security. Um, we are FedRAMP authorized. FedRAMP authorized, <laughs> StateRAMP authorized, ITAR compliant, CGIS compliant, SOC 2, uh, Type 2, uh, ISO 27001, PCI DSS certified, certified by TrustArc for online privacy. Um, yeah. And, and then the last thing from a security perspective, I think a lot of people are still, I mean, a lot of us and rightly so are sensitive about these, these packages. Um, let's talk about our record level encryption. Sure. So each record within a keeper vault is protected by its own client side generated 256 bit AES key. So if you have 10,000 records within your vault, you have 10,000 individual 256 bit AES keys protecting each individual record. And, Mike, if it's appropriate, I'd like to pass it to Travis. Um, and Travis can just do a quick, maybe a five, 10 minute um, overview of our security model. I think it's really important to the context. And at this point, I think we've laid out the, the user friendliness piece, um, calling in Travis um, to do a, an overview of security. This is meant to demonstrate, this is one of our biggest um, differentiators between Keeper and other solutions out there. We take pride in our security model. Um, and Travis will, will cover that for us. So Travis, I'll pass the, the screen to you and the mic. Um, have you cover this kind of in depth? I think it'd be an appropriate exercise. Yeah, Travis, Travis, you can speak to it to a high level. We got about four minutes here and we'll open up to some questions. Uh, yeah, absolutely. By all means, let me just get my screen shared here. And Can we see my Keeper encryption security yep. model? Yes, sir. Gotcha, buddy. All right. Yeah. So, so Keeper is built on a zero knowledge, zero trust architecture. And what that means is that all the encryption and decryption takes place exclusively on your devices. Uh, that also means that no employee of Keeper security can uh, decrypt your data, nor can we access your admin console. Um, and then the next question that we typically get about this is basically how how is that encryption working uh, with uh, most commonly single sign-on authentication? So this is what that looks like uh, from a diagram standpoint. So this this would be if you're you're logging with let's say uh, Entra, Azure, um, you know Google Workspace, one one of those types of providers. We do support anything with SAML 2.0. So your first layer of encryption is going to be an elliptic curve key, and then that is if you're familiar with those keys, they're essentially unbreakable. Uh, and then that's going to unwrap a data key. That's our second layer of encryption. Now, this is typically where our competition stops protecting you. Uh, at the third layer of encryption, this is where things get really interesting. Uh, every record and folder within your vault is going to get its own AES-256 key. If you're familiar with those keys, they take 100 trillion, trillion, trillion years to break each individual key. So if you have 10,000 records in your vault, you're going to have 10,000 uh, of those keys protecting those records. Now, our encryption model is patented and our single sign-on model is patented. So nobody can do it the way that we do it. And that gives us some advantages and we're perfectly fine with that. Uh, now, the next question that we get is typically about the uh, offline access to data. Uh, we do have an offline mode that can be turned off in the admin console if you prefer. Um, when you're in offline mode, you're actually using something called ciphertext. That's a combination of your elliptic curve key with your data key. That's an extremely dense cloud of encryption. So, uh, so using this in offline mode is perfectly safe. Uh, that's also what we're storing on the Keeper cloud side. So what that means is, is everything that Keeper is storing is actually uh, just gibberish and nothing becomes actual data until it gets to your device and gets decrypted. And then uh, as Dunnigan had mentioned, uh, we are the, the most uh, secure uh, audited platform in the industry and certified, uh, as well as uh, from a password management standpoint and from a privileged access management standpoint. And, and he mentioned, you know, FedRAMP authorized, state ramp authorized, uh, ISO 27001, SOC 2, and so on. Um, so we, we're, we're very vigilant on this front. We also have uh, regular penetration testing, regular, um, we have a bug bounty program. Um, so people will say, well, you know, it's great that you have all these certifications, but 
how do you handle the more sophisticated attacks in the industry? Uh, so the first type of attack that we'll talk about is a man in the middle attack. So the way that we defeat that is every device that's accessing your Keeper Vault has to be approved. So with this device authorization, essentially, that's going to, to defeat that attack before it can even get started. No data between your device and the Keeper Cloud can be intercepted or decrypted. The next type of attack that we have is enumeration. And the way that our encryption keys are generated, there's no way to perform an enumeration uh, attack on them. And then the, the last type of attack would be a brute force attack. So uh, with a brute force attack, what our system is going to do is it's going to actually throttle down. It's going to slow down by order of magnitude when it detects that attack. It's going to detect that after about 10 attempts. And uh, so it doesn't really matter what they throw at us. Quantum computer, artificial intelligence, our system controls the login screens. Uh, so it's going to shut that down uh, in transit. The last question that we typically get is uh, regarding data isolation, and, and you have full control over that. Uh, obviously, when you choose to work with Keeper, you're going to choose your data center, uh, and you have choices of United States, United States GovCloud, which is FedRAMP, Europe, Australia, Japan, and Canada. Once you choose your data center, all of your data is exclusive to that data center, and your data is going to be fully redundant and fully encrypted, whether at rest or in transit. So. That's a quick brief overview of our uh, security model, and I'll go ahead and turn it back to my colleagues. Great, thank you so much. I think with that said, we'll turn over to some questions uh, from the yeah, audience. Looks like we have some. Looks like we have yeah. some in the chat. Um, one. Yeah, we've got, we've got a few here. Um, uh, there's one from Tyler asking: Does Keeper have a package that can be used by multiple users, different vaults? And with one admin that can control sees if necessary with someone leaving the company. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, so everyone with Keeper will have their own vault, right? And you may have like a break glass vault at the admin level um, if you wanted to, but every user will have their own vault. And within those vaults, the admin can take control slash sees. So it would be more you're transferring the account. You absolutely can do that. We have that account transfer um, feature that allows you to transfer a vault for outgoing employees in its entirety. Everything will come over. Right. And in the admin console, you get full visibility of the hygiene um, and set the requirements um, and restrictions as you need. Okay. Super. Um, there's a question here from Jonathan who's wondering, is uh, 2FA in Keeper your own, or are you integrating third-party 2FA products? Yeah, so it's actually our own. Um, you, we do integrate with third-party two-factor authentication solutions for getting into the Keeper vault. But when you saw me put the do the autofill on Dropbox, that was actually Keeper acting as the authenticator. Um, so anything that'll take the Google or Microsoft authenticator, Keeper can be the authenticator. Um, and that can be shared amongst teams as well. So you can put that in a shared folder, and if that two-factor code lives in the Keeper record, everyone that's in that uh, folder will be able to see it. Okay, excellent. Uh, another question here uh, from Richard is wondering, do you have a mechanism for sharing 2FA codes among multiple people who need, a share, who need shared account access so those folks don't have to ask the person whose phone number is attached to the account for the 2FA code? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you would you would do that. Um, putting in the shared folder is typically the most common way to do it. You could also add everyone individually to the record itself um, and everyone will have access to that. It's great. Great call. So, yeah, so you don't have to hit up the person. I always say that. Excellent. Um, the question here, with the volatile geopolitics of this past year that are likely to get worse before getting better, are you working on any new capabilities to help better protect enterprises against sophisticated nation state actors. So uh, that's uh, fun. Um, so we do have the ability to IP whitelist um, groups of users. You also have um, any type of ranges or device controls, things like that, that you've set on your identity provider side as it would pertain to locking in the keeper. Um, that'll all be respected. Um, additionally, each new login does require device approval. So if someone logs in into a you know adversarial nation as a location, um, that's going to be flagged, and the user will get an email that that's taking place. And obviously, they would not approve that login, um, even if they did get the device approved. They would then need to actually do the login um, with a single sign-on solution, which would 
probably not work. If you had the boundary set up or our IP whitelist set up, it wouldn't work in either case. All right, and, and we can set up a deep dive to go back through uh, deeper into our security model and our uh, encryption process to help um, make you feel more confident about that and, and discover some more capabilities that would lend to that. Okay. Yeah, and, and that last question, you know, about new, new capabilities that we have, um, certainly we have a lot coming out that Q1 and Q2, I, I did elaborate on that question, but, but fantastic question. Super. Um, there's another one here. Does Keeper encrypt privileged credentials from end to end? Absolutely. Travis, do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, it's just, I mean, essentially you're talking about a, um, you know, a TLS tunnel. The TLS tunnel is pinned and essentially our, uh, our proprietary encryption, our, our triple, triple grade military encryption running through that TLS tunnel. Um, so 100% end to end from the Keeper cloud to your device. Uh, again, as we'd mentioned, uh, no way for that for anyone to do a man in the middle attack uh, to to intercept or decrypt your data whatsoever. Okay, excellent. Um, here's another question here. They're wondering is single sign on foolproof security. Um, and this is kind of a variant on a question that I always like to ask. You know, if you remember those breakfast commercials, you know, from Saturday morning cartoons, you know, it's like this, you know, Captain Crunch or whatever is part of this complete breakfast. You know, what <laughs> what part do you guys cover with, with uh, you know, with what you've got? And then what else do people need to be, um, you know, putting in their environment for a secure environment? Yeah, sure. sure. So, uh, obviously, uh, there's multiple layers to it. I wouldn't say single security is a, a SSO is a, is a one-stop shop. That's a part of why Keeper exists today. And, but what we do is we, we help, um, um, not do we just, not only do we deliver the keeper security via that, we also can deploy via that. And so we're, we're a nice add on uh, feature to increase your security posture and your, and your parameter. Donegan, do you have something else? Yeah. Additionally, we, we fill in the SSO security gaps, right? So not every single website or application allows you to single sign on into it. So for all those places, keeper can fill in those gaps. Um, yeah, in, in short, like what organizations should be doing at, at a bare minimum, probably before they do anything else, should be um, enforcing password hygiene with, through a password manager, um, have a two-factor authentication, single sign-on if you're you know, an, an organization of that size, um, that you know, it makes sense to get one. Um, and then, you know, obviously training people as much as is humanly possible to hover over links before they click on them, don't download things, et cetera. Um, and your organization's in great shape. That's like most of this stuff is happening from that, um, for sure, like 80 plus percent of everything. And if I can add to that, the for, for, for a lot of folks that are going to single sign on, they're going there because they like the word passwordless. And where Keeper kind of steps in and says, look, where your single sign on doesn't cover, like Dunnigan said, we step in. And so what we, what we, what we genuinely believe, if you want to accomplish a true passwordless experience, Keeper becomes that add-on feature that extends to give you a true password experience, extending to those applications and to those websites that don't take password or that don't do SSO, providing the pass keys and providing any of the other uh, forms of credentials. Okay, excellent. Um, there's probably one more question here. They're wondering, is, is Keeper cloud only? Yeah, so, uh, so yes and no. So the, the, the base of what we have is, is cloud-based. Our connection manager can be run on a local server um, today. We are road mapping for other things, but that it, we, we set primarily in the cloud, but our keeper connection manager, and we have a lot of use cases, as I said earlier, built on Apache Guacamole, where um, guys or gals will be using it in some uh, air-gapped environments. And that one is able to do that, but not the, the rest of the platform today. Okay. All right. Excellent. Well, um, you know, with uh, you know, with Travis answering a lot of the questions um, in the console, um, and uh, you know, I, I think we've gotten through um, most or all of our audience questions here. Um, so, Mike, just a, sort of a last question. You know, if somebody wants to get started with Keeper or, or find out more, what do, what do you recommend they do? Yeah, so you more than I, the first thing I always recommend folks to do is go to our website and start a free trial. So you see a personal trial here, but you can go start that trial and that gives us insight as to um, what you're looking for. And then we can set up a call for sure with you um, get going. All of our contact information is found um, on our KeeperSecurity.com um, website. OK, excellent. Well, um, 
Mike and uh, and and Dunnigan and Travis, uh, thanks to all three of you for a, a great presentation and uh, and uh, a demo and an extra demo. This was great, uh, and thanks for all the insights in the Q and A. Really appreciate your time today. Absolutely, we appreciate the opportunity. All right, and so uh, our last piece of business here before the we wrap up is the Amazon gift card prize drawing. And this is also, of course, a last opportunity to uh, to grab that handout uh, before before we wrap up here. Uh, but the winner of the two hundred and fifty dollars Amazon gift card is Chris Sains from California. So congratulations to Chris. We'll be in touch to get you your card. So with that, on behalf of the actual tech media team, I want to thank Keeper for making this event possible. And thanks, as always, for attending and for for all of your great questions throughout the session today. That concludes this event. Have a fantastic rest of your day.